Most people today are aware that in the final weeks of World War II, the Nazi authorities began to move Germany's remaining gold and currency reserves out of Berlin, which was threatened by the Soviet advance. It was cached in salt mines in southern Germany to protect it from the rapidly advancing Allies, often co-located with art treasures from German museums as well as looted art from private collectors. The greatest treasure, representing the majority of Germany's remaining wealth, was captured by U.S. troops hidden in the vast Kaiserhorder mine in the town of Merkers on the 7th of April 1945. Penetrating deep underground after being tipped off to the treasure's location, GIs discovered underground galleries crammed with Reichsbank gold, sacks of currency and art. In the main vault, the Americans discovered 8,307 gold bars and 55 boxes of gold bullion, plus over 3,600 bags of German currency, 80 bags of foreign currency, and much else besides. The gold alone would be worth today $6 billion. Though the Merkur's treasure represented the majority of Nazi Germany's remaining wealth, billions more had been secreted in other places, hidden to await recovery after the war. A vast Allied organization was created to try and find this missing gold, and some was stolen by corrupt officials and opportunistic soldiers in the chaos of post-war Germany. This is the story of one barely known robbery that rivals the plot to the famous war adventure movie Kelly's Heroes, remains one of the most successful gold heists in history. As part of operations to recover Reichsbank gold bullion and paper currency concealed on orders from Berlin by German mountain troops in a series of hand-built bunkers in the Alps, several large caches of bullion were found by US Army intelligence officers in the months after the German surrender. One operation on the 7th of June 1945 was commanded by Major William R. Geiler and consisted of officers and men of Company C, 55th Armoured Engineer Battalion, 10th Armoured Division. German officer prisoners and civilians had confessed to hiding the gold and agreed to lead Geiler and his men to the location near Steinriegel in Lower Austria. A bunker was uncovered at the site and inside stashed in wet burlap sacks marked Reichsbank Hauptkasse, translated as main cash office, was a king's ransom. Each bag contained two 25-pound gold bars and there were 364 bags or 728 gold bars weighing 9 tons and worth today about $550 million. The astonished GIs, with German help, spent hours moving this treasure down the mountain to two-and-a-half-ton army trucks, where under a heavy guard it was driven to Mittenwald and on to Garmisch, the 10th Armoured Division's headquarters. On the 9th of June it was driven onwards to the US 7th Army headquarters in Munich. Major Geiler received a receipt, and on the 10th of June 1945, the bullion was driven to Augsburg, where it joined other recovered gold and currency and was transferred to Frankfurt. At the Reichsbank building in Frankfurt, the Americans had created a central holding and processing facility for Nazi gold, run by officials from the Federal Reserve Bank in Washington, D.C. The gold recovered by Major Geiler was counted. It was all there, all 728 bars. Mission accomplished. But what remained largely unknown for decades after this successful operation was the concurrent theft of another large gold hoard, apparently by US personnel, an incredible hoard of a hundred gold bars that weighed one and a quarter tons, a hoard that has never been seen again. The publicity attached to the recovery of the Steinriegel gold hoard successfully diverted attention away from a separate hoard that was found and recovered relatively close by and by another 10th Armoured Division unit. On the 7th of June 1945, the same day Major Geiler set out to recover the Steinriegel hoard, Sergeant Albert Singleton received a phone call from his superior, Captain Craig. 
At the time, Singleton, of Company A, 61st Armoured Infantry Battalion, 10th Armoured Division, was acting Provost Marshal for Mittenwald, his jurisdiction as part of the U.S. occupation extending to Mittenwald, Waldgau, Krun, and a couple of other small towns in the region. Captain Craig told Singleton that orders had arrived from 10th Division headquarters at Garmisch for Singleton, a couple of his men, and a half-track to collect five German officer prisoners from the Mountain Troop barracks at Mittenwald, who would take them to a gold stash, which Singleton was to recover. The senior German officer was apparently Major Adolf Weiss of the 54th Mountain Engineer Battalion. According to American sources, the tip-off regarding both hordes had come from an SS Lieutenant General, a prisoner of war, who was cooperating with the Allies. The next morning, Singleton left on his mission. Outside Mittenwald, he met with two unnamed U.S. intelligence officers, who he said were probably from the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, who had two trucks with them, two and a half tonners, with drivers. In total, Singleton's little convoy contained 12 people. Singleton followed the trucks towards Kroon until they stopped beside a creek on the right. Dismounting, everyone clambered about 600 feet up a steep incline to a piece of land that was flat. Here, Major Weiss revealed a trapdoor leading to a bunker 10 by 12 foot square and 9 feet deep. Inside were some German infantry weapons and three stacks of gold bars, three feet high by three foot square. The bars of gold were relayed down the hill to the trucks and placed in burlap sacks. The gold was then driven away by the two intelligence officers and their two drivers. Before departing, Singleton recalled his unease. Quote, they did at least put the gold in burlap bags, but I remember making the comment, well, you sure as hell don't have many guards to guard this. And they said, look, we don't want to attract any attention. Then they drove away, and I never saw them or the gold again. End quote. Singleton returned to Mittenwald, where he claimed he received a telegram later that day from the 10th Armoured Division headquarters in Garmisch, informing him that the gold had reached Munich safely and not one bar was missing. However, the Frankfurt Depository, where all the Nazi gold was sent and collected, had no records of ever having seen the 100 bars that Singleton recovered, only the 728 bars from the hoard recovered by Major Geiler the day before. Investigations in the 1970s and 80s have not doubted Singleton's version of events, but what became of the gold after Munich has never been established. And did the Singleton gold actually belong to the Reichsbank, like the Geiler cash, or was it connected to another part of the Nazi state? The major problem is the size of the cash recovered by Singleton. 100 gold bars, weighing one and a quarter tons, would not have required two army trucks to move it. When interviewed in the 1980s, Singleton said that the intelligence on the cache's location had come from an SS general named Strach, arrested in Mittenwald. Searching SS records, the authors of the famous book Nazi Gold, Ian Sayer and Douglas Botting, concluded that there was no German general in the SS by the name of Strach. In fact, the only general struck in the entire Wehrmacht was a Panzergrenadier officer, totally unconnected with the region. But interestingly, a German named Dr. Hans Struck had been arrested by U.S. troops in Kolgru, not far from Mittenwald. He was Nazi consul general to Hungary and formerly of the Ribbentrop Bureau, Joachim von Ribbentrop being Hitler's foreign minister. The day before Strack's arrest, U.S. forces had recovered a stash in Fusen, west of Garmisch. It consisted of 24 boxes of gold bars and coins. The boxes and bags were marked Foreign Office Berlin. Was this a part of the infamous Ribbentrop Gold, the missing German Foreign Office treasure, much of which remains missing to this day? And was the Singleton Hoard another part of that treasure? Foreign Minister von Ribbentrop had created a private gold fund, largely from seized Belgian bullion and Italian gold coins. This was revealed during the diplomats' trial at Nuremberg in 1948, two years after von Ribbentrop had been hanged as a war criminal. The Ribbentrop gold fund, under his personal control, weighed 15 tons and today would be worth over $900 million. 
As the war was coming to an end, von Ribbentrop had 11 tons of this gold shipped south out of Bavaria, just as the Reichsbank was doing the same with Germany's remaining gold and currency reserves. Six and a half tons was deposited at von Ribbentrop's country estate, Castle Fuschel, in Austria. A further 3.3 tons was listed as hidden around Lake Constance, and two-thirds of a ton from this stash was sent to Bern in Switzerland. The Americans subsequently recovered 1.45 tons of gold bars and coins from a house in Fusen, one ton of gold bars from a farmhouse 30 kilometers from Constance at Isny, and 1.6 tons of gold bars in a house in Lindau on Lake Constance. That's just over four tons, plus we know what happened to two-thirds of a ton sent to Switzerland. Regarding the six and a half tons at Schloss Fuschel, this was allegedly recovered by US forces. However, the story behind this is rather sketchy. But there is no trace of Ribbentrop gold ever having made it to the US collecting center at Frankfurt. Remember, it was only in 1948, three years after the war, that the Ribbentrop Gold Fund was admitted to by Foreign Office officials on trial in Nuremberg. Anyway, some six and a half tons of Ribbentrop Gold at Schloss Fuschel was, like the Singleton Hoard, never seen again, though US forces made reference to its alleged recovery at the castle in 1945. A 1950 investigation by the chief U.S. prosecutor at the diplomat's trial, Kempner, via the U.S. Congress, turned up no new information regarding what became of the six and a half tons of Ribbentrop gold at Schloss Fuschel. In 1959, the British Gold Commissioner on the Allied Commission charged with dealing with Nazi gold, Sir Ronald Wingate, said that he believed caches of gold remained buried in the mountains in Austria. Rumours persist today that Ribbentrop gold remains buried near the castle, and indeed an Italian gold coin from the treasure was found close by some years ago. Was the Singleton hoard much larger than admitted to at the time, large enough perhaps to require two army trucks to move? What has been established is the following. Sergeant Singleton recovered 25 boxes worth of gold bullion, that is 100 bars, on the 8th of June 1945, and handed it over to two U.S. officers that he identified as OSS types, though he never had their names, and this gold subsequently disappeared. And six and a half tons of Ribbentrop gold from Schloss Fuschel has never been seen again either. In total, this amounts to seven and three quarter tons of gold bullion with gold prices today at around $46,000 per kilo, that's over $366 million. And someone has it, or at least part of it, and perhaps quite a lot of it remains buried in caches in the Austrian mountains today. Further research by the authors of Nazi Gold have proposed identities to the two unnamed intelligence officers who drove off with the Singleton Horde. Colonel James Fisher, an American of British parentage, was appointed chief investigator in the cartel branch of the U.S. military government in Berlin just after the war. His job was the rounding up of missing gold, platinum, uranium and diamonds from the Reich Precious Metals Bureau, worth tens of billions of dollars at today's prices. It has been suggested that the enormous wealth passing through his office corrupted him. As they say in the book Nazi Gold, Quote, out there in the lawless outback of a once rich nation in ruins, and armed with priceless insider information that was his alone, the opportunities for a man in Fisher's privileged position to make a killing and become astronomically rich outright were legion. If he found what he was looking for, who else was to know? If he made his own purely personal arrangements to dispose of what he found, who was to stop him? End quote. Fischer and his men ranged all over Germany, particularly southern Germany. Circumstantial evidence exists that places Fischer and an associate named Stock at the site of the Singleton Hoard. Fischer was later discovered bartering his ill-gotten gains through a Berlin-based Soviet buying agency, selling not only gold, but anything from stocks to antiques to fine art. 
Fisher's scams were so extensive that he even was able to open an import-export agency with offices in New York City, Paris and Brussels, whilst he was a serving army officer in Berlin. The British intelligence service, MI6, tipped off the US Counterintelligence Corps and Fisher was arrested. On the 9th of November 1946, he was found guilty of trading with the enemy, dishonourably discharged from the army and given one and a half years hard labour in Germany. A second trial in December 1946 was actually closed down on orders from higher authorities, as it was simply too embarrassing for the US occupation authorities. On the 5th of June 1947, Colonel Fisher was released and allowed to return to the US, where he became a very successful businessman. All the files determining his criminality were later destroyed by order of the US government. As the authors of Nazi Gold point out, Fisher remained the only US intelligence officer who had the remit to locate the second cache of gold on the Steinriegel. The means and opportunity to make off with it, in the manner described by eyewitness Sergeant Singleton, and the unique insider information about how to dispose of it, end quote. Was Colonel James Fisher and his men the real-life Kelly's heroes? It remains an intriguing possibility. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share, and also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below. Thank you.